All right, so here's the sexual interview, okay? Questions to ask, history. What is the problem in your understanding of it? What was it like growing up in your family? Have to do with family of origin. What was your family's attitudes and beliefs about sex? This would be great questions for premarital. Mm -hmm. um, how it was talked about or whether it was unmentionable? How did you find out about sex? Here's some history stuff. Here's some current stuff. Their relationship and sexual history. When did you learn about sex? How did you learn about sex? Have you ever had sex before? Right? Who have you had sex with? Have, have you ever had sex that was painful for you? Um, have you ever had sex in a way that would be considered out of the normal? Like, um, like uh, an exhibition or something? You know, anything that's sort of sexual deviant a little bit? Um, what is it like for you now? Work, relationship, any problems you're perceived? What is your reason for coming now? As opposed to coming years before, what's changed? So then you want to start interviewing for desire, arousal, orgasm, and resolution. So, what are your feelings about sex? Have you experienced any negative emotions about sex? When did they first begin? Have you ever experienced positive sexual desire for your spouse for a previous mate? I've had couples who come in where they've had a lot of desire for their previous mate and very little for the one that they're with. <laughs> Um, what, if anything, helps increase your desire for sex with your spouse? What <coughs> is it? What efforts have you made to try to cultivate appropriate sexual desire? What worries you about trying to cultivate desire? So you talk about it. There's a lot of couples that don't talk about their sex. Like what feels good, what doesn't feel good, you know, what they like, what they don't like. Like that's really important during sex to be talking. And then there's a lot of embarrassment and shame. You know, like if sex is just for procreation and they don't talk What efforts uh, have they made to try to solve it? Oh, that is the one. Okay. Interview for arousal. Have you had difficulty achieving or maintaining arousal through sexual right. activity? I have a quick question on that. Like how, um, how often would you say those conversations like have, you need to have, you know, the, yeah. kind of like multiple different perspectives on that? Um, so. Well, I think definitely any time you try out something new. Okay. There needs to be that conversation. I also think Because the woman is in a different phase, both just in the 20 minutes and also within. So just to be able to be, hey, does this feel good? Is this okay? Are you comfortable? You know, um, do you feel connected? That's a great question to ask before sex. Do you feel connected right now? You know, because to push a sexual experience on. Um, what happens when you lose your arousal? What is necessary to achieve physical and emotional arousal for sex? Um, who initiates sex? This is a great, this one's a great question. Who initiates sex? How? Is it planned? Is it spontaneous? And what's the frequency? So who initiates sex is telling, right? How is it initiated? And there's really abrupt ways of initiating sex, and there's very gentle ways of initiating sex. You know, um, I have a couple right now with a sexual expectation of male sex every day. And so they've actually been having sex every day for probably like 10 years. Like, wow. And so how does he approach her on sex? I mean, they don't even, it's just like, he comes home and that's the first thing they do. So it's, there's no novelty to it, there's no spontaneity to it. There's frequency, and there's and it's planned. Um, I have a question too from uh, couples that will say, is it okay to plan sex? What do you guys think? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes? Sometimes you have to, you gotta, right. like I need to say, you gotta schedule it. Right. Like, especially if you've got all those kids, you keep bopping around. Right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think you, I think scheduling it is can be a really good thing. I think you can over schedule it, mm -hmm. or it's a bad thing. Mm -hmm. And then also one thing I've noticed is that if you schedule it, there could also be disappointment. Mm 
Mm. Let me tell you right now, for man, do you put it on the calendar? <laughs> and, that and that doesn't happen, <laughs> right? It could lead to anger and resentment. You committed. Yeah, you committed, right? It would be better for you to put it on a calendar 30 minutes from now than to put it on a calendar two days from now or like in the morning. Or that's the downside of it because the expectation, there's not as many things interfering with the follow through of schedule set for a man than there is for a woman. Right? And so that's a big deal. And there has to be some flexibility. If you're going to schedule it, some flexibility to say, you know what, this isn't going to work out. I'm not in a good place. I'm exhausted. Rather than just doing it because it's on your schedule, you know, checking it off. I've got wives that work with it. Sex that is like that. It's just a checkbox. All right, okay, let's just do it. All right, Dad, now I'm going to do laundry. <laughs> you know, it's seriously, it's so disconnected. And it's just about, I mean, you're, you're a sex doll is what you are. You know, and it's, it's sad, right? So, um, okay. And do you for orgasm? Do both achieve satisfactory orgasm? If not, why not? Does orgasm take too long? Too premature? How much time does it take? Multiple orgasms? How many? How many women in this world do you think have multiple orgasms? What percent? I mean, it's like, I know it's, I don't know the exact number, but it is in the low five, four, three, two, or one percent. Mm -hmm. Really low. Mm -hmm. That multiple orgasm. That's not the way it looks like in the movies. <laughs> the woman has potential for multiple orgasms, but multiple orgasms are really unlikely for women. Um, by the way, you know, like the, um, Nymphomaniac, right? That is a disorder, right? Something's wrong if you want too much of it on both sides. I'm not talking about a healthy sexual desire. I'm talking about, right? It's not. It's not um, sexual desire and appetite for sex is not connected to the nuances of everything. It's separated from it, and that's why you can desire it all the time because it's it's it's, it's disconnected. Oh wait, oh sorry, resolution. Uh, how do you experience one another immediately following sex? Do you ever feel alone following sex? And if so, why? Do you have connected feelings after sex? If not, what do you, uh, what do you think is missing? Okay. Any of you for technique? What sexual positions and activities provide the degree of pleasure and connection? This is an interesting one to ask a couple. It's really vulnerable for them to share with you. Right. Does your spouse know this? Is he or she able or willing to provide this activity? Do you know what pleases your spouse most and are you able or willing to provide it? What constitutes foreplay? How quickly do you move to the erogenous areas of sex? Do you attempt to have simultaneous orgasms? Are there any activities or body parts off limits for either spouse? That's a really good question. That would be a great premarital question. Unless you don't know yet. And you have to discover that after you get married. Um, has your spouse ever violated your trust in regards to sexual matters? This is part of the relationship interview. Do you feel coerced to try new things related to sex? Do you feel you have the right to refuse sex because of interest, emotions, or tiredness, etc.? The right to refuse sex is really important. Uh, what happens when you talk about your sexual feelings and your spouse talks about their sexual feelings? Do you talk? I'm sure my grandparents never talked about sex with each other. <laughs> I'm sure of it. <laughs> I mean, I think it was like a dirty word to say sex. Like they just did it and then like they didn't actually do it, right? Like they're acting like they didn't do it. Uh, oh <laughs> My grandparents are dead, so they can't get a hold of this word. <laughs> All right, um, here's some treatment exercises I'll go over and I'll let you guys go. Um, one of the most popular ones for desire and arousal is the sensate focus exercise. And this exercise rehabilitates yourself to non-sexual touch. And so when sex has been attached to orgasm, it's part of the dysfunction. You basically have the couple, um, the goal is to focus on sensations, not performance or pleasure, sexual pleasure. 
to returning them to sensations like sluts and safe focus. You have a couple engage in non-genital click pleasing, touching both each other members fully clothed, could include holding hands, back rubs, etc. So they start back at phase one, and the assignment is for them to go home, lay next to each other, and to touch each other physically with clothes on, not in erogenous areas. Discuss with the couple structure versus unstructured frequency potential. Um, and then you have mastered the step until moving on to the next step. They also keep a journal with them. So after they do their this first phase, they journal afterwards with experiences that their experience of it, questions that they have, and they bring it back to therapy. And they share that journal with you, the therapist. Um, they have to master this before they can move on. Right? So if they start to do this and they get aroused, then they gotta stay here until they can do this without arousal. Okay? Because it's again it's it's back to sensation and rehabilitating them to sensation. Okay. Then the second the second step is typically involves genital pleasuring. During this stage, the counselor encourages the couple to extend gentle touching in a way that's pleasurable. Remaining focused on the sensation rather than the erection of the orgasm, the still non-orgasmic touch. Once again, the stage needs to be mastered before moving to the next stage. Okay. So I also have a stage in between. It's like where they take their clothes off and they're touching each other, but not in the erogenous areas. So they do clothes on and clothes off, where they touch each other, but don't. They allow themselves to experience um, sexuality without touching the sexual organ, which can be very erotic. They forget, right, if they just go for the gusto, that it actually impacts the sexual experience. And so it's, you know, it's like touching their face, their neck and their arms and all that kind of stuff, right? So, um, okay. And then the, the final step, the couple is given permission to engage in sexual intercourse. The couple may be asked to maintain the intercourse. Um, woman determines depth, speed, and amount of time. Female, female posterior position when you introduce this. And then the couple needs to continue to focus on sensation, not orgasm. And so they can, they can go back to the other phases. Um, again, this is a whole rehabilitation process for them. So I had a couple I worked with, it took them six months to get this. So they stayed in, and they just committed themselves to not having, to not being sexual with each other through phase one and phase two. No orgasm. Through those phases, I had the, I had the four phases, so it's like close on, close off, no erogenous zones, then close off erogenous zones, no orgasm, and then the first orgasm was in intercourse, or just prior to that, intercourse for the female, she couldn't have orgasm there. <coughs> And then there's a treatment for premature ejaculation. There's a start and stop technique. So this helps couples learn how to slow down orgasms. Um, so the partner's asked to manually uh, stimulate until the point of inevitability, which is right before the point of orgasm. And then the partner signals, either verbally or non-verbally, for the partner to receive stimulation. And then they have to control not having an orgasm. Because the association is aroused orgasm, aroused orgasm. So they need to get aroused and not have an orgasm. And then the partner then resumes stimulation following 50, 60 seconds. Um, once engaged in intercourse, the woman controls thrusting using longer, slower thrusts. Faster, long, faster thrusts um, are more stimulating and they're bad for premature ejaculation. So one way to help with that is that the woman takes control, superior slows it down and allows the man to stay erect without orgasm for longer. fun to talk about. <laughs> you, guys are, you guys are all looking at me like, did he just say, slow it down? <laughs> Let's go back to talking about attachment. <laughs> all right, so I have some couple thoughts that you guys can go over on your own. You know, honoring touch, honoring sex for connection, honoring its place in the creative order. So, any questions? This may be the last sex talk. <laughs> this might be it. You may not want to miss out on anything I can answer for you. Yeah, apparently it should have been the first. <laughs> Is this helpful? Yes. Okay. Great.
great material for premarital.